I want uh, you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to, uh, to Acts chapter 7. We're going to be all over the book of Acts today as we look at, the, um, at a uh, kind of a new sermon series uh, that uh, we're going to be looking at for the next six weeks entitled Stories from Heaven and Hell. For six, um, for six Sundays, you'll hear stories of spiritual successes and spiritual failures taken right out of the Bible. And sometimes these stories will be told verbatim by the Bible characters themselves in Scripture. Um, but, uh, but before we get, but before we get too, too far ahead of ourselves, I want to really talk about the term success and failure. And especially the terms I've just used, spiritual success and spiritual failure. So let me say right at the outset that God's definition of success does not resemble ours. We sometimes gauge success by great talent or a sparkling personality or luxury and travel or material wealth. But success in God's kingdom is defined by relationships, especially that relationship with God. And the ripple effects of the character traits that those relationships have in your life and the lives of others. Things like forgiveness, eternal life, peace, confidence, not in ourselves, but in the Lord. Those are the spiritual successes as we see the character of Christ growing in us and overflowing from us into the lives of other people. It's all about a relationship with Christ, vertical, and then those horizontal relationships that result. So God does not necessarily call you to earthly success or failure like the world thinks. All the popularity and praise. He calls you only to himself. And if you accept that call and find yourself in God and under Christ's lordship, you are truly successful. A spiritual success. Different people in the Bible had spiritual success as they connected to the Lord and different people in the Bible had spiritual failure as they disconnected with Christ. Now, importantly, these sermons will also include what we can learn from these various characters highlighted in the Bible. You know, it's said that you learn from your mistakes, but it's far better to learn from other people's mistakes, isn't it? And so as we look in the Bible at these Bible heroes, we will learn from their successes and we will learn from their mistakes. And the first character that I want to look at in this sermon series is our subject for today, and it's the Apostle Paul. Paul was a person who lost it all but found everything. He was a rock star in the theological world 2,000 years ago. Educated under the famous rabbi Gamaliel, he could walk into any city, go into the Jewish synagogue, and instantly be invited to speak. Now Gamaliel, his teacher, uh, is mentioned in the Bible, but also is mentioned in other ancient documents as well. In the Jewish Talmud, Gamaliel is described as being a, a prince among rabbis, a master teacher, and he is also mentioned as the president of the Sanhedrin. In another historical document, the Mishnah, Gamaliel is mentioned as being one of the greatest teachers in the history of Judaism. Paul was his star student, and Paul was well known and respected among the Jewish people 2,000 years ago around the world. And it's perhaps for this reason that in the Bible, when we first encounter Paul, also known as Saul, he is traveling from city to city on a quest to persecute Christians. He wanted to wipe out everyone who was a follower of Jesus. The first time we see him is in Acts chapter 7 of the Bible. It's when Stephen, one of the first deacons, is testifying about his faith in Jesus. Finally, the crowd had had enough. And they turned on him in violence. In verse 57, the Bible says, The crowd covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, 
these people that were stoning Stephen laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. The Bible says, and when he said this, he fell asleep. He was stoned to death by the crowd. I don't want that to affect our deacon nominations, uh, bottom line. But, um, but the first deacon that was the first martyr for the Christian faith was the deacon Stephen. Then in the very next verse, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read, And Saul, you know, Paul was also known as Saul, and Saul was there approving of their killing him. So, so Saul, Paul, started his career persecuting Christians. Now, one thing about persecuting Christians, though, is that you're around a lot of Christians. And so maybe it was the love that Stephen exhibited, forgiving the ones who were taking his own life. Or maybe it was the witness of the others that he was throwing into prison. But God began to soften the heart of this horrible man. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 9, the Lord was ready and he revealed himself to Saul in a powerful way. In this account, Paul is on the road to Damascus to round up Christians and to bring them back to Jerusalem uh, to, uh, to uh, imprison them. As he came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven shined all around him. Paul was knocked off his feet. And as he fell, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. And he was astonished at the reply as the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul trembled with fear and asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord then started giving him instructions that have had the ripple effect into eternity as Paul turned into a gospel preaching, church planting powerhouse. This story of Paul's conversion, it, it's moved into the English language as a Damascus Road experience. If somebody says, I had a Damascus Road experience, that means they were confronted by something so uh, so such a calamity, such, a, such an unmistakable uh, uh, sign that they knew instantly what to do. They call it a Damascus Road experience. And this story of Paul's conversion, this Damascus Road experience became a key to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Within just a few generations, the whole known world had heard about Jesus as Paul went around the world sharing his Damascus Road experience. Also accompanying his lips was the testimony of his life. When he walked into town, people knew that this one who had once traveled around the world to persecute Christians was now traveling around the world to preach the good news of Jesus, to plant churches, and to introduce everyone to the Lord. He told his story of conversion as he just repeatedly, as he stood before city officials, governors, and kings. In a world where most people were born and lived and died and never traveled a hundred miles from their home, Paul traveled from Arabia to Rome, all around the world, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Sometimes today, churches kind of lag behind in the use of technology but Paul, again, was on the cutting edge of the technology of his day, using the new Roman road system, using the shipping lanes, using this newfangled thing called the letter and developing the circular letter and using the franchise method of church planting, all because he was driven to share that Jesus had come that Jesus had died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and that Jesus had risen from the grave, defeating death for all who would come to him for grace and mercy. Paul's obsessive, compulsive personality now worked in his favor. And we'd better be glad that Paul found Christ, or more accurately, that Christ found Paul. 
Because if Paul had not become a believer, he would have continued to travel around the world, killing the disciples of Christ. But now we see him traveling around the world, making disciples of Christ. The Apostle Paul also was a great strategist because his strategy was Christ-centered. Remember what Jesus told his disciples after the resurrection and before he ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, 9, he said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And Paul, that's just the strategy that he adopted starting in and around Jerusalem and then traveling around the world, usually starting with the chief city of that region, the Jerusalem of that region, he would go and he would, he would, he would lead that city to the Lord and the ripple effects would be seen throughout that whole region. He would always start by going to the synagogue, remembering probably Jesus, what Jesus said when he said to go to the Jew first, then to the Gentiles, so he's a strategist. So he goes, he just tries to unpack that in whatever way he can. So I'm going to go to the synagogue. And you remember, Paul was well known and educated under Gamaliel, so he was usually invited to speak. And of course, he was speaking and sharing his wisdom. He would now announce, and oh, by the way, we found the Messiah. His name is Jesus Christ. Finally, Paul went as far as Europe and encountered cities without synagogues and so what would he do then well he would try to find a prayer meeting or a or a group of Jews or a group of other seekers that were that 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 were praying or their hearts were sensitive to the Lord to to get to know them and to announce the good news of the Messiah sometimes he would meet a person of peace uh, this person that that would get it that would accept Christ and that was maybe had a gathering personality and was that person that could gather other people to come and hear about Jesus in the church planting world today we call that person a Lydia a new church if you find your Lydia that's that person that uh, that is converted and and their conversion their life draws other people here's why we call that person a Lydia in Acts 16 verse 12 we see Paul going to Philippi which is the chief city of the region of Macedonia that's in present-day Greece he did this in a response to a dream where he saw a Macedonian calling him come over and help us he had never dreamed about going to Europe with the gospel they didn't have synagogues over there and so he answers this dream and he goes to Philippi. Remember, he usually goes to the synagogue, but this city in Europe, it's so far out, they didn't have a synagogue. So in verse 13, he goes to the riverside on the Sabbath day where he heard that there was a prayer meeting going on. And he sat down and he spoke to the participants in this prayer meeting. In verse 14, one of the women who was at that prayer meeting, was named Lydia. She was a seller of purple dye. And as she heard about the Messiah, she opened her heart to the news about Jesus. And then she and her household were baptized. And then she invited Paul and his group to come to her house to stay there and to be that center where which, from which he could, he could share the good news of Jesus. This made Philippi the first place in Europe that Paul went to with the gospel. This is the moment that the gospel made the jump from Asia to Europe. And we're here today because of Lydia. We're here today as mainly Europeans who have heard the gospel because of Paul and his willingness to do new things and to go into new areas and to and maybe to go one step beyond his comfort level in order to serve the Lord. Paul was a strategist. Paul was also a world traveler, establishing scores of churches. And then he multiplied his influence even further using media. In this case, writing these circular letters with brilliant teachings and clear teachings 
written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So listen to this. Even though Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles, he was one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament. Of the 27 books of the New Testament, 13 or 14 are traditionally attributed to Paul. So Paul's a world traveler. Paul's a strategist. Paul uses technology. Paul uses the media. We're certainly here today because of these letters that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that shared two simple but powerful doctrines. Paul was kind of a simple person. Two doctrines in Paul's writings. Number one, how to be saved. Number two, how the saved ought to live. Everything else in Paul's writings comes under one of those two headings. So we can learn much about the life of Paul from the Bible, not only from his teachings and not only from his testimony, but from his example. His lips testified to Jesus, but his life testified to Jesus as well. Now, I do want you to know this. Paul was a real human just like us. Sometimes we think of these Bible characters as superhumans in a stained glass window. But Paul had strengths, strengths and weaknesses just like we do. And Paul had a call from God just like we do. And Paul had a purpose for his life. And so do we. So we have a lot in common with Paul. He's not just a character in a stained glass window. We can hear from God. We can turn from our ways. We can be used of the Lord. We can pursue God's purpose for our lives. Now, in looking at the life of Paul, one thing that we learn is that God can use your influence. God used his position of influence to lead many people to the Lord. He was a famous rabbi. And he leveraged that fame to be invited to speak in synagogues and to share with whole cities the good news that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, had come. Well, you might think, I don't have the fame and reputation and riveting testimony of Paul. But you do have a position of influence with the people around you, your family, your children, your friends, co-workers, and neighbors. And in fact, the people in your circles of influence are people that Paul could have never reached. In fact, you probably know people in your circles of influence that no preacher could ever reach. So just like Paul, simply dedicate your influence to the Lord. Dedicate your testimony and your story to the Lord. To be used of Him, to glorify Him, and to exalt His fame wherever you go and with ever, everyone you meet. God can use your position of influence. Secondly, God can use your strengths. Now, we all know Paul's strengths. His strengths, in my opinion, looking at Scripture, were intellect, eloquence in writing, although the Bible records that Paul was not very impressive in person. So eloquence in writing, intellect, strategic thinking, loyalty, commitment, and a work ethic. Now, maybe you don't have the same strengths as Paul. But everyone has their own unique set of strengths. Maybe your strength is to bake a pie, to do home repairs, to sit with a sick person, to coach kids. There's no record that Paul could do any of those things. But each of these things can be powerful bridges across which you can use to influence others towards Jesus Christ. So just take a minute to think about the things that you enjoy doing. Just think about that. Think about the things you enjoy doing. Think about the things that you're good at. And as you think about those things, whatever God shows you about what you can do and your strengths, that's probably what God wants to use in using you to change the world. And now ask God, well, Lord, I want you to bless my strengths and my interests and the things that I'm good at. I want to dedicate those to you. And now God blesses you to go and use those talents and strengths to glorify God and to minister to others. 
You see, our goal is sometimes to increase our fame and our abundance. But we instead should desire to increase his fame. Well, towards the end of his life, Paul realizes that his time is short. We see this in the book of 2 Timothy, one of the last things that he wrote. It may have been the very last thing he wrote. In verse uh, 6 of Tim, 2 Timothy 4, he wrote this. He said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm already being poured out. Now, he's in prison at this time. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure is near. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Over and over again in his letters, Paul would repeat, I'm not ashamed of my bonds. He was in prison quite a bit. Over and over again, he would write, I'm not ashamed of my imprisonment. I'm not ashamed of my bonds. Well, why would he, why would he be ashamed? Well, you see, they had a doctrine back then called the doctrine of divine retribution. Back then, they had this idea that, that God would reward or punish you for choices you made in this life. And if you were experiencing any adversity at all, it meant that you or your ancestors had sinned in some way. And so Paul's in prison, and I imagine his enemies were saying, yeah, look at that Paul, look at that message of Jesus now. Yeah, Paul is uh, really being punished for doing that. And Paul's wrote, no, I'm not ashamed of my bonds. Because Jesus had said, you will be persecuted if you're sold out to Jesus. Oh, the TV evangelist promised a big house and two cars and wonderful health if you follow Jesus. But those early Christians knew that that was not the case. These early Christians frequently lost their house and lost their job and lost their health and sometimes lost their lives because of their commitment to Christ. But Paul knew what real success was. Paul knew that even if you lose your job and your friends and even your life, it's so much sweeter to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And now I want to read to you possibly the last thing that, that Paul ever wrote. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 9 and going all the way to the end of the book. Paul's in prison again. His demise is at hand. He had already written to Timothy, my departure is at hand. And here are his final instructions to Timothy. He writes in verse 9, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my defense, so now he's talking about being before the Roman court. At my defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla, Aquila, and the household of Onesphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. 
Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. When we studied this passage of Scripture during the Amazing Collection, I remember thinking this famous rock star, this famous rabbi, now reduced to prison with everyone having deserted him, writing to a young pastor, Timothy, that he was not ashamed of his bonds. And even though everyone had deserted him and there was no one to stand with him when he was put on trial, he had fought the good fight, he had finished the course, and he had kept the faith. And, oh, Timothy, please bring my cloak and try to get here before winter. Paul may have never realized at that moment, languishing in prison, the effect that those letters and his testimony have had on the world. And now 20 centuries later, his influence for the Lord echoes into eternity. We're now over 2.5 billion people on earth in some way named the name of Jesus as central to their faith. So follow Paul's example and just simply dedicate your all to the Lord. Be faithful to the end, because with Jesus, it's not your end. It's just the beginning of eternity for you. Now, as we get ready to close in prayer, I want to challenge you to do a couple of more things following Paul's example. First of all, I want you to follow Paul's example and do a turnaround in your life today. Some of you still are waiting for that Damascus Road experience. Oh, it's easy for Paul. He had a Damascus Road experience. That's why he decided to serve the Lord. Well, if the Lord would give me a Damascus Road experience, I'd do that too. If the Lord would do something just so unusual in my life, I would do that too. If the Lord would do something so cataclysmic in my life, I would follow him too. If the Lord would knock me off my feet, I would follow him too. And then 2020 comes our way. He's doing it. Remember, Paul was with others who had a Damascus Road experience as well. He was with a group of people that experienced that. It wasn't exactly the same way, but it was unmistakable. The Lord showed up, but it's no record that they did anything different. But Paul did. The light, the voice. Paul was knocked off his feet and he said two things. Number one, who are you, Lord? And then number two, what do you want me to do? Maybe in response to 2020, we've been rocked. And maybe we ought to just do what, the, what, what Paul did and just say, who are you, Lord, in this? Who are you? What are you doing in this situation? And now, Lord, what do you want me to do? I don't want to be like the others at that Damascus Road experience that we never hear from again. I want to be that person like Paul whose life does a turnaround because he was sensitive to the Lord's work in his life. Paul did something different. Is your life at a dead end? Have you run out of options? Well, my first advice is what do you have to lose? Do something different. In the Bible, it's called repentance. It means a change of mind. It means to turn around. It means that your life does a 180. Like the lepers in the Old Testament, their city was under siege and they were starving. And these two lepers at the city gate says, why sit, here we, why sit here till we die? And they did something. They said, there's food over there in the enemy's camp. Let's just go over there. And when they did, God routed the army. And the whole camp was there and all the food was there. And they started eating and the abundance. And they said, we can't just do this. It's not good for us to just sit here and do this. Let's tell the city. And the whole city came out and was safe. Do something different. Susan is a great tennis player. We watched tennis and, and we were watching this match. It was a five-setter. And the, and the, and the person had, had lost one set 6-0. And the person had lost the second set 6-1. And they're asking Martina Navratilova, one of the great tennis coaches, what should they do? She says, I don't know what they should do, but I would just tell them, do something different. 
They're doing the same. Just do something different. How, how uncomfortable. We, in our addiction and recovery ministry, how uncomfortable does an addict get before they do something different? How much, how, how, how much are you going to languish in your spiritual life with those same habits and hang-ups and hurts and bitterness before you do something different? Paul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And his life course took a 180. And now this person that had persecuted Christians was making Christians through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, 2020 is your Damascus road. But only if you respond and say, who are you, Lord? What are you doing in this situation? And what do you want me to do let's go to the lord in prayer lord jesus help us to do something different to do something noble to do something good and to do something that is fueled by by us hearing the voice of of god in the situations that we find ourselves in and help us to to just respond lord what do you want me to do now now while your heads are bowed and while your eyes are closed why would the Lord tell somebody what to do that's not planning to do it so as you ask Lord what would you have me to do I want you to take a big breath and take the biggest risk of your life and decide that whatever the Lord tells you you'll follow wherever he leads you'll go Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? For some of you, it's to begin a relationship with Christ. Pray this prayer with me. The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pray this prayer with me if you need Jesus as your Savior and Lord. It goes like this. Lord, I'll open the door of my life and I welcome you to come in. Just pray that prayer to him. He's a, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way into your life. But he stands at the door and knocks. Just pray that to him. Lord, I open the door of my life and I welcome you to come in. Take control of my life. I'm tired of being in the driver's seat. I want you to be in the driver's seat of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. I open the door of my life and I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. Forgive me. Put me right with you. Show me your plan. Show me what to do. And also, thank you for eternal life in heaven that you rose from the grave, defeating death for me. Thank you for giving your blood for me on the cross and now help me always to live for you. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want you to let me know. I'll be here in our gathering place after our service. We've got some materials that will help you to grow as a Christian. If you're listening by radio or streaming, just let us know. Uh, give, us a, give us a phone call at uh, 864-223-4377 or info at southmain.church. Let us know. We have some materials that will help you grow as a Christian. But Christians, some of you need your life to do a turnaround as well. You know you're a Christian, you've prayed to receive Christ, but lately, um, lately you've been living your own life. And uh, you, need to, you need Christ to be back there on the driver's seat of your life as well. So pray this prayer to rededicate your life to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a Christian, but lately I've been making my own choices, living life in my own strength, living life in my own ingenuity and creativity without a regard for your will. And as a result, I've sinned against you. So now, Lord, I once again pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit until there's no room for me left. I want you to be on the pilot seat of my life. I want you to, again, just help me to, to exhibit your character and not my own. I rededicate my life to you. Folks, Paul was launched on the adventure of a lifetime. What is the adventure that God has for you? What's the adventure story that he has written for your life? 
Don't you want to know it? If you do, say like Paul, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that we've had together. And now as we go from this place, I pray that we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. I pray that this week would characterize our lives by every moment saying, Lord, I want to go your way. I want to speak your words. I want to have your thoughts. Show me where you want me to go. And uh, Lord, as we go from this place, as always, help us to know that the service begins, it doesn't end as we walk out these doors. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and depart to serve the Lord. Have a great week.